Okay, so uh, is, is, is this okay? I can get going, okay? So uh, I, I put the, uh, the words observable events and typical trajectories in quotation uh, because it's really a matter of interpretation, what you mean by typical, right? So in finite dimension, I think it's, uh, people probably more or less agree that Lebesgue measure is important, and so Lebesgue typi typical with respect to Lebesgue is important. But in infinite dimension, there's really no uh, such thing. So th this is really all, uh, it's only one way of interpreting things. Don't mean to suggest that I have the solution to any of this. Okay. So <coughs> I'm going to talk about some the, the same body of ideas, like uh, three different times in three different contexts. The first time is in finite dimensions for deterministic meaning uh, dynamical systems, meaning uh, without the stochastic component. And I'm going to use this as an excuse to introduce some of the ideas. And then I will go to finite dimension, but noisy. And then I will go to infinite dimension. And uh, to what degree can some of these things be done in infinite dimensions, such as for uh, semi-flows uh, generated by PDEs. Okay. So th this, is the, the, this is the plan of the, of the talk. And so setting the f to start with is that I'm going to do, uh, so M is either uh, RD or Riemannian manifold in finite dimension. And my maps are always, I'm going to do maps. That you can have exactly the same version for flows. It won't make any difference. Just f uh, discrete times, just easier f for me to say. It's, uh, it's, it's always in the differentiable category. It's probably often invertible. And M is going to be Lebesgue measure or Riemannian measure in the case of a manifold, but I'm going to just say Lebesgue. Okay? So as I have said, uh, I'm going to take the point of view uh, for this part of the talk that observable events are exactly the same as those sets with positive Lebesgue measure. So observability equals positive Lebesgue measure. And I'm just kind of declaring that. And this is, people generally find this to be more or less the right thing to do in finite dimensions. And I, the, most of the talk will be about systems that are not conservative. So the setting is like, kind of like this. You have a set, an open set, and it maps into itself. And so uh, because it maps into itself, if you keep iterating, it gets closer and closer to something that I'm going to call an attractor. That's, that's the setting in which the, my dynamical system will work. Okay? And so now there is, in this setting, there is an ideal or hoped for uh, dynamical picture. I didn't s oh, the closure of U. So I just say the whole thing goes inside of itself. And then, so this is a situation where you really decrease volume. It gets squeezed into something in the middle. Okay? I, I'm not really assuming a whole lot more than this. Okay? So there's a dynamical picture now that. Do you, want, hmm? do you want that to be the intersection or the union? Oh. Thank you. I mean the intersection. <coughs> yeah, intersection, intersection, not union. Okay, okay. And um, so, so th there's a picture that one would like to have, right? And be kind of like the dream picture. And that is that if you start with the bank measure and you use the system to transport it forward, it's going to converge to something. Transportation of the bank measure for will converge to something, and if, con if, it con if it converges to something, then it's automatically invariant. Right? So now you've got an invariant measure. Usually, dynamical systems have zillions of invariant measures, but if it converges, this has got to be a really important one. Okay? If it converges, okay. And moreover, <coughs> if you if it converges, then you can talk about the Lyapunov exponent. Of, which is defined to be, I'm actually only interested in the largest Lyapunov exponent. I'm going to look at the rate of growth of the norm of the derivative. Okay. Uh, you can either think of this as mu almost everywhere or Lebesgue almost everywhere. They are technically different, but since I'm only talking about picture, I'm going to confuse them. Okay. So if I look at this biggest Lyapunov exponent, and if it's negative, then the picture should be that everything just goes down to a sink, right? Since there's no expansion. So the, 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 that means that dfn, the, the norm, is shrinking smaller and smaller. So it should go to a sink. That's what you would expect it to happen. But what if it's growing? Then it's something very chaotic. That means that there's a lot of stretching around. And the, the hope is that it's going to be an SRB measure. So let me say what an SRB measure is. Okay. So what are SRB measures? Okay. So for Hamiltonian systems, 
there's a given that you think of uh, the bank measure as most important, there's obviously one important measure, which is Liouville measure. Okay? Uh, what if it's dissipative? And I don't mean anything uh, <coughs> physical about this. I just mean, it's, for example, volume de not conservative, volume decreasing, for example. <coughs> then you cannot have an invariant density. There's no chance of having an invariant measure with a density. Okay, okay. <coughs> we just talked about there are these two cases. When it's uh, shrinking, then it probably goes to a sink. Oh, I left out zero. It's not likely to happen, right? It's hard. When would it be exactly equal to zero? Probably not. Okay. So it's either shrinking, then it's a sink, or it's positive. When it's positive, then there is th this idea of an SRB measure, which is defined like this. It's an invariant measure with the probability that almost everywhere there's some expansion. And the conditional measures of, so when there's expansion, there are positive exponents, there are unstable manifolds, which are just uh, invariant objects in the unstable directions, in the expanding direction. Then the condi conditional measure of the measure on these un unstable manifolds have densities. So what does it, this mean? If the whole thing is volume decreasing, then you cannot have an invariant density. right? But why is it that it doesn't have an invari invariant density? Well, when you contract, you shrink things, pushing them to become delta functions, so you cannot have a density. But the expanding size stretches things around, they express things around. So the next best thing to having an invariant density is to have it in the expanding direction. Since you cannot have it in all directions, the next best thing is to have it in just the expanding direction. There's no chance of having it in the contracting direction. Okay? So this is the idea of an SRB measure. Uh, SRB equals uh, Sinai, Ruel, and Bowen. And um, these measures were first uh, constructed for a class of uh, attractors called Axime attractors by these three guys. And then the idea got expanded, uh, extended to more general dynamical systems. Um, uh, the idea of an SRB measure, but not necessarily its existence. So the existence of SRB measure is going to be an issue, but the idea continues to work. Okay. So SRB measures are, for volume decreasing systems, the next best thing to having invariant densities. That's kind of the, the idea. So why is it that if I push forward Lebesgue, it should go to an SRB measure? Well, you see, you take a box, you push it forward, it stretches and it contracts. You push it forward, it stretches some more, and it contracts. It's going to line up in the unstable manifolds. That's kind of the idea, right? Nobody says this is true, but <laughs> this, is, this is kind of the picture that one would hope is always the case. Okay. So um, why are SRB measures important? <coughs> so um, SRB measures are important because they are visible. And so far, I haven't told you why they're visible. I said the bank measure is visible, but SRB measures are singular. They live on attractors, so why are they visible? So here's a, a, a definition that a point is called future generic if its time averages will converge to the space average given by that measure. Okay? So in other words, the, these, the statistics of the, that orbit is described by the measure nu. Okay? So it's called generic with respect to nu if is statistics are described by the measure nu. Okay? So that's, uh, that's a definition. And here's a theorem. Uh, the people to kind of complete the last steps were Pew and Shu, but it was really built on a lot of work of many other people, so, so uh, too many to mention. So, but anyway, if, <coughs> if nu is an SRB measure, and there are no zero Lyapunov exponents, if it's an ergodic SRB measure, has no zero Lyapunov exponents, then the set of future generic points have positive Lebesgue measure. Okay. So th that means it's observable. Even though the measure itself is singular, the set of points that, whose properties are reflected in nu has positive Lebesgue measure. That's kind of the next best thing that one could hope to have. Right? So you cannot have an invariant density. So you have, you have a, the, all the measures are necessarily singular, but it still reflects the properties of a positive uh, Lebesgue measure set. And I'm going to give you a quick proof of it, because this, the idea is very simple, and it's going to show up again and again. So locally, I'm gonna, it's not this nice, but let's say that you have a bunch of unstable directions, so the map expands this way. You have a contracting direction, so it contracts this way, expands this way. So suppose that the measure is 
almost every point, so think of this on this line, almost every point is generic with respect to the measure nu. Okay? Well, uh, if, you, if you're on a stable manifold, they, in the future, they come closer and closer together, which means that if this point is generic, the whole stable manifold is going to be future generic. Okay? So, well, uh, if the foliation is nice enough, like if it's smooth, then I look at the bake measure here, I integrate out here, and the whole thing, the whole two-dimensional space will become, uh, it consists of future generic points. This stable manifold is almost smooth, unfortunately, but it's good enough. It's absolutely continuous. Okay? And I'm going to come back to this idea of absolute continuity over and over. Okay? So this is kind of the idea of why. So, so SRB measures are the best thing that you can get when, when it's uh, contract volume decreasing. And if there are no zero exponents, so there's only stretching and contracting, because the foliation is nice enough, you can recover the entire um, positive Lebesgue measure set uh, on, on, the, on the manifold. <coughs> okay. so, so this theorem is false if you have a zero exponent? Yeah, you don't know what happens in that direction. <laughs> so, so there must be something, OK, maybe you already indicated that this is a kind of an ideal picture, right? Because it would really go this way. It seems to suggest that it's really nice, right? non-future genetic <laughs> points have uh, zero Lebesgue measure, right? The, sorry? It, 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 I mean, it seems to suggest actually that the complement of the future genetic positive uh, 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 future yeah. genetic point so, so has zero effect measure. If, if this was true, yeah. Right. Because, right. because you're just saying as positive effect measure, so. Well, actually, it won't go to the, this entire, is of course, not ah, right. Okay. It goes okay. to some positive measure set, right? Okay. It goes, but which is still very visible. If this oh, is okay. true, it's still very positive measure set, yeah. Not entire manifold. That's, that's, okay. that's, not, that's incorrect. Right. Okay, that's okay. So that, yeah. That, yeah. Right, that right, right. Right, right. No, it's positive Lebesgue like, measure, right? You, you you take something positive here, <coughs> integrate out positive there. If you can integrate, which uh, which you can, if the foliation is nice, then you have got a positive measure set. So this is these are the ideas. No, a positive measure set for, for the attractor, for, not for the attractor, but for on the, the manifold for the basin of attraction. Yeah. But yeah. Not for the well, you can no, 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 the, the basin of attraction is an open, is, is not necessarily yeah. an open set, but it's, it's, a, it's really, if you're an RD, this is positive measure in RD. It's, right. you, it's the really, the yeah. The attractor itself is zero measure, right? If it's volume decreasing, the attractor always is zero measure, and yet you still see this thing. Yeah. This is kind of the idea of it, okay? And these ideas are kind of the ones that are getting uh, 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 extended. Okay, so I'm just uh, repeating again what picture I was dreaming about to have, and now comes reality. It's true for a class of attractors called Axime attractors. Uh, Axime was something that basically says everywhere is uniformly expanding and contracting. The picture, the, the whole space is saddle-like everywhere with uniform expansion and contraction. A very kind of idealized kind of situation is true. You can really, everything I said is true. Okay? In general, unfortunately, it's not true. Because when you take you, you look at the bank measure and you try to push it forward, nobody says it's going to converge. It could just slosh over everywhere and doesn't converge to anything. Okay, that could happen. Another thing that could happen is that the limit it may converge to something, but that limit is fractured into bits of everything. Okay, you see, having an SRB measure on an attractor basically says that there's a whole chunk of, if the picture I told you was true, that means that there's a whole chunk of the face space that's organized very nicely, right? Why should that be the case? It's not necessarily the case. The face space just may not be organized nicely. So, for example, there's a very well known phenomenon called Newhouse's infinitely many sinks, okay? When if you push forward the bake, it just split up into zillions of little pieces, infinitely many little bits of pieces, okay? Or, and sometimes, it, even the limit exists and these other things don't happen, it may still not be SRB, and that's the canonical example that everybody gives. This is just a flow where uh, the, con it's, the saddle contracts a little bit more than it expands. So there's a figure eight attractor. If you push forward Lebesgue measure, it will go on to this figure eight attractor. But the only place that could support measure at this point is not. The, this, this thing which goes around doesn't support measure. Okay. So 
there could be things in your system that just doesn't, they, they, they don't support measure, so you cannot have it. So having measure is a problem, it's an issue. It's very hard to prove, even when it's true. So there are not that many examples. Okay. I mean, you think that it's true. I think you, people want to assume it's true. It looks like it's true if you <laughs> run simulations, but it's pretty hard to prove. Okay. Um, it's kind of, you're talking about 100 page proofs, that kind of things. Okay. So, so let me go to, let me add some noise to the dynamical system. Okay. So th this is what I mean, I'm gonna talk about, well, I'm gonna call it a random dynamical system. And this is what I mean by it. You take a manifold, and you look at the space of maps of the manifold to itself, let's say CR maps, and you put a probability measure on the space of maps. Okay? And then you just draw them out, IID, and you compose them. Okay? So this is what a random dynamical system is. You just compose IID maps with, law, uh, with a fixed law. You can do this, in two, you can look at two-sided compositions, you can look at one-sided compositions. The, this is just some notation. <coughs> so Fn, omega. So everything is kind of, I'm trying to convince you that everything just looks kind of like before, except that it's got an omega attached to it, depending on the realization of the, the, that, that you have picked. Now, you may think that this is not a very natural thing. Maybe it's kind of artificial. So my big justification for it is that this is true, for, this is how stochastic flows of different morphisms are, okay? So if you have an SDE with uh, Brownian noise, so I have a Stratonovich one, okay, with the DWT is Brownian motion, then for any realization of Brownian path, you really have a, a family of, of a flow, a time-dependent flow. So this just has the flow property. So it behaves exactly like the uh, ordinary flows that comes from uh, ODEs, except that it's got an omega. So it's like for each realization of Brownian path, you just have a, a, a family, a one parameter family of uh, uh, different morphisms that are flow maps that behave. So if you look at time one, time two, time three, you have exactly what I have up there. Okay? So it's not so, uh, not, I'm trying to justify that it's not so artificial. Okay, so now for these guys, there are two notions of invariant measures. One is the, the stationary measure, which is the, the theoretical mean. Right? You take this mu on the manifold, this lifts on the manifold, you push it forward using a random map, and you average over all the maps, and it doesn't change. This is the stationary one. But there's also another notion, the pathwise viewpoint. The pathwise viewpoint is that you fix a realization, let's say from minus infinity to infinity, and you'll see in a moment why I'm so interested in going from minus infinity now. Then you can, what, what you can do is to take this, uh, you take mu, the invariant measure, and condition it on the past. Then you get a family of measures that I call sample measures. So what are the properties of these sample measures? They're invariant. So you have a realization, and you, you, take this, you take a sample measure, you use the map to push it forward, and it corresponds to the sample measure with the translate of the, of the, of the Brownian path. Okay? Now this is a really important property of it. It's trivial, but it's, it's important. Is that one way to get this, uh, because it's the conditional, because it's mu condition on the path, this, this kind of sample measure corresponds exactly to the following. You back up 100 years, 100 years ago, you have no information, so you put mu. Mu is the theoretical average, right? So when you have no information, you assume it's mu. And then you transport it forward because you know what happened the last 100 years, so you use the last 100 years to transport mu forward and let the 100 go to infinity, and you get these sample measures. Okay? So this is really just Martingale. The fact that it converges to the, to the sample measures is really just Martingale convergence. Okay, so, so again, what, what are these sample measures? You, you are interested in what happens today, given that you know the history. Okay? So, well, you don't know the history to, from minus infinity, but you know it for the last 100 years. So you go back 100 years, you don't know anything beyond that, so you assume that it's the theoretical average, and then you use what you know to push it forward, and you go farther and farther back, you push it forward, and these are the, these are the sample measures. 
Okay? So the interpretation is, and I think that in like when, when people look at uh, uh, real processes, these guys are really closer to what you're interested in in some ways than the theoretical mean because mu is the theoretical mean, whereas these guys, these measures, describe what you see at time zero, given that it, you know this, what has happened in the past. Okay? So given at least some finite history, probably not infinite history, but given the history, this is what you see today. Okay? But, so how's this relevant? But isn't, when mu is, see, if you have a little bit of noise at all, then mu is probably like Lebesgue has a density. So isn't this just what we wanted? We pushed forward Lebesgue and we got the invariant measure. This thing that we was hoping to get in the, in, in the ideal picture, that if you push forward Lebesgue, you would get some invariant measure. Well, pushing forward mu gives you these guys. So in some sense, these guys are the ones that you were hoping to have that you could not always have. You always have this and it's cheap for stochastic flows. Okay? It comes for free. As long as mu has a density, you have it. You really push forward stuff and you have it. Okay. So um, before going on, just to mention that this pathwise notion is the composing different maps, but you actually have the same thing. The Epinoff exponents, entropy, all these things can be defined for these as well as you can define it for uh, iterating a map. But the, the, the thing being that when you iterate a map, you jump from here to here to here. You really don't know that you're iterating a map. You could very well be iterating different maps, okay? But why should you have anything? Well, you've got statistics on your side. That's why you have a lot, much nicer things, okay? So, uh, so the, the ideal picture, I have two points. One point is that I push forward Lebesgue, it converges. But the other one is that it converges on something really nice. It's either a sink or an SRB. And here, <coughs> it is in fact the case. So given a random dynamical system, with stationary measure, the, the average one, mu. Uh, so lambda, lambda max is the largest of the Epinoff exponent. If it's less than zero, then these sample measures uh, live on sinks. Okay? This is actually quite easy to prove, but it's true. And if it has a density, then these are random SRB measures. Okay? They really are smooth on unstable manifolds. Okay? So it's actually true. All the things that you kind of want it to be true for uh, in the deterministic case, but cannot prove, either very hard to prove or not true, are actually true here. So, um, so I, I proved this with Le Drapier a long time ago, when we actually weren't trying to prove this, we were trying to prove this formula that entropy was equal to the sum of the Lyapunov exponents. And from that, you can kind of deduce it back. You can deduce this SRB result back. And uh, so, it, kind of bothered me for a while <laughs> that I had to take this long loop before I could prove this fact. I mean, I told you that I drew, I drew the picture for you, right? You push it forward, it stretches out, it should do this. Yeah. So why couldn't I prove it directly? Well, I did, okay. Yeah. I could prove it directly. The proof is really what I told you. You prove it, it stretches out, it lines up with those. Okay. That's, uh, so so uh, a little bit of noise goes a long way. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the, okay. So, um, so now I get to the infinite dimensional part. And the issue, of course, that is that there's no Lebesgue, right? So uh, and the question is wh what to do in the absence of that. So to uh, <coughs> motivate the ideas, okay, uh, let me first talk about the case of uh, uh, when there is a finite dimensional center manifold. Okay? So I, I want to first talk about that case to get the ideas, and then I will go to the um, go, go, go to the more general situation. So now this situation has been looked at by lots and lots of people. People typically look at a specific equation. I'm going to formulate the geometric conditions that are behind them. Okay? So the results that I'm stating, uh, uh, except for one, is not new, but just to motivate where things are coming from. Okay, so now this is, so, so this is like the setting when you have an inertial manifold. Banach space is the time t map of the flow. Okay. So there is a reference splitting, which is not necessarily, it's not invariant or anything. I just have uh, a splitting into horizontal and vertical, okay, two closed subspaces. In the horizontal direction, I don't care. In the vertical direction, it has to come squashing down. 
okay? It's very mild conditions. So the, this is the main one. This is the main one that matters. So it basically says that there are cones. So it just says that if you have, if this is EC and this is ES, then there's a cone here so that when you map it to the next point, uh, this part goes inside that part. Okay? So there's a cone that kind of goes into itself. That's okay. It's, uh, and, and then uh, the, uh, for, for vectors in this cone, uh, there is a minimum amount of uh, stretching. It can be it can be stretching on in, in, the, in, in these cones. I don't really care whether it's uh, expanding or contracting. It could be anything. But it can't be zero. You can't contract by arbitrarily large amount. There has to be a minimum amount of uh, like this for some lambda. Lambda could be positive or negative. Okay? So it can't, I mean, in, an, in, in, the, in the ES direction, of course, it can uh, contract by arbitrarily large amount, but not in this direction. And similarly for CS. So there's a, also a cone in the, uh, so, so this is goes there. There's a cone in the, uh, in the uh, EC, ES direction uh, that is invariant. But of course, I cannot back up. So the, instead of backing up, you say, if you have a vector and it goes there, then it has the properties that you need. Okay? So in, basically, in ES, you contract. In, e, in EC, you can, uh, near ES, you contract. Near EC, you expand or contract, but not as much as in ES. That's the, okay? So this is the, the, the setting that, um, so uh, lots of examples <coughs> satisfy this kind of things. It's mostly the, 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 the linear part determines roughly what the splitting is, and the nonlinear part is not bad enough to totally destroy it, and that's kind of w where we are. Okay, so, so the theorem. Under these assumptions of the geometric condition of this kind of possibly expanding or contracting and much more strongly contracting in the directions, you have a center manifold, which is the graph of a function. And this has been proved by uh, lots and lots of people, often under different conditions for specific equations and under different sets of conditions, but they roughly boil down to the same thing. Okay? Um, so I'm certainly not taking credit for any of this. It's old, old theorem. Okay? Um, and then, so there's a, so that means that there is something which is a graph from EC to ES, right? Roughly in the EC direction, you have a center manifold. Is it a finite dimensional one? No, doesn't have to be. No, not now. So far, it can be anything. Okay? And then there is also the existence of the WS foliation. WS foliation, why don't I just show you that? Anyway, w, WS foliation just says that there in the roughly the ES direction, you have a foliation. And each leaf, these are, code, these, are, these are infinite dimensional objects, right? So the mapping would carry one of these leaves to another leaf, and distances are contracted. Okay. I wasn't able to find out who proved this first. It's not me, lots of people before me. Okay, but they may not have said it this way. But <laughs> this is what it, it, it's it's no. Okay, so these two A and B are known things that are very classical things. That so you have something which is either neutral or slightly positive, uh, and then you have something that's strongly contracting. Then you have a, a center manifold and some foliation. That's uh, so the the pic the picture is really one where you have and then. Like uh, foliation, like that. Okay, and these leaves are invariant and they are contracted. Okay, this is a, the, a, a very nice picture. Okay, so here's the result that was new a while ago, but not new anymore. It's that this is the the, the stable foliation is absolutely continuous, and for this I need the W C to be finite dimensional. Okay, otherwise I don't know how to define absolute continuity. Okay. So when the center manifold is uh, finite dimensional, so absolute continuity means this. I didn't quite say it before, but it's the same meaning. Is that if I take two transversals to the foliation, okay, 
And if you look at a sliding map that follows the leaves of the foliation, these foli the, the leaves of these, this WS foliation are co finite co-dimension, right? infinite dimension. But you can nevertheless follow them and slide down like this. This map preserves the Lebesgue measure class on the transversals. Okay. In the previous examples that you gave, which, which ones would have finite dimensional? Uh, hmm? Uh, no, the ones they have all, all have finite, fine, they all do. The, the two examples that I gave, yeah. one, one, one is the uh, reaction diffusion, yeah. the other one is the damned Klein Gordon. They, okay. they, they are finite. They're finite, yeah. yeah. And, and, but the dimension depends upon. The, basically, you look at the spectrum of the linear yeah. part, you have to find a big enough gap <laughs> somewhere, then you can guarantee the uh, uh, finite dimensional center manifold. Okay. So, so, so what, what, what this result says is that you can slide along up and down here. This foliation is, again, usually not smooth. Actually, it can be smooth if the gap is really, really huge, but often not. Okay? But it, it, it's good enough that it pre the, the sliding map, uh, people call it the holonomy map, okay? uh, preserves the Lebesgue measure class. Okay? So let me go to the interpretation of kind of what I mean by that. Okay. Uh, uh, so now, if you look at the existence of, of the uh, center manifold, uh, existence of actually, I should say, a finite dimensional center manifold. Okay. So what does that mean? It just means that, oh, the dynamics, essentially, it's captured by some finite dimensional object, right? So it's kind of vague. It doesn't quite say what it means, because everything goes there. Everything would kind of get contracted down to it. So there is some uh, finite dimensional object that captures something. The existence of this foliation says more. Okay. It says, see, see there, there's this center manifold, but if you are from the observational point of view, you would never be on it, right? You would pick an initial condition and you would never be on that manifold. Okay. But so the existence of this stable foliation, if you pick any initial condition, if you look at how it evolves, there's actually a guy down on that manifold that you are going to follow forever, ex exponentially fast. Okay. You're going to get exponentially close to some another solution, which is on that manifold. So if you know the solutions on this manifold, well, the arrows don't mm -hmm. come in like this, right? They, they, yeah, they they come like this, very very. Yes. Otherwise, it looks like it goes through. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't go through. They go to that manifold, right? And they follow. They, these things are not stationary, right? They move, right? They these move, things don't they move. move they move around. They follow exactly what what's going on in that manifold. So this is stronger than just saying that, oh, it's coming near some finite dimensional object. It says that everyone actually has a guy down there that describes it. And conversely, take any point down there, there's a whole finite co-dimensional set of initial conditions that will follow it. Okay? So that's uh, the first two things. And what is the third thing? The th but so far, there is no notion of what's typical. Right? I mean, everything, there's something down there, there's something there. You know, there's a one to one correspondence, not one to one, but many to one correspondence. Everything is captured by something on a manifold. But there's no notion of typical. Now, of course, on WC, because it's finite dimensional, there's a notion of what typical is, if you believe in Lebesgue measure. Okay? So on WC, there's a notion of what typical is. And this results on the absolute continuity of the stable foliation says, any time you take a slice, through in, in this space that's transversal to the WS, okay? and almost all, uh, so let's say WC is k-dimensional. Most k-dimensional slices would be to that. Okay? You have to be pretty unlucky to cut it this way. You probably cut something like that. Then whatever you see on the slice that you take, the notion of typical is exactly the same as the notion of typical on WC. Okay? So there's a pretty reasonable notion of typical for k-dimensional parameter families of initial conditions. Okay. So if the WC is k-dimensional, then for, and of course if you have it for k-dimensional, then it works for something bigger than k also, right? So you cannot take something that's lower than dimension k, but for k-dimensional, you take a typical, you take a plane, you take a slice, you cut it every which way. There is the notion of Whatever you see as uh, Lebesgue measure zero, 
it's consistent with however you cut it. It doesn't change. So this is the, the meaning of, the, uh, of this result. So what, what it says is that there's a notion of almost everywhere, in quote, in quote that says that if okay, Lebesgue almost every x at property P, then property P holds for any k parameter family of initial conditions. Okay. So if you solve the problem in finite dimension, then you have the problem on the whole thing for k parameter families, for typical k parameter families of initial conditions. Okay. So uh, this idea. Uh, this, this, so this idea is part of the idea that says that observability in the sense of Lebesgue measure in infinite dimensions um, can be obtained via finite dimensional probes. Right? So you want to have something that's finite dimension. It's, you're in a Banach space. What do you do? You send in probes. You send in finite dimensional objects and probe at different places to see if it's right. Okay. So this, is, this body of ideas has been around for, for a while. The first place that I learned about this, uh, actually not the first place, went back and learned about, discovered that it's there, is a long, long time ago in a book by, uh, this is Father Lyndon Strauss, and, and, and on, on function and uh, fun nonlinear geometric theory. Okay, so this, it's, it's been there for a long time. I think it's called something like Har Null, the middle bank measure zero thing is called Har Null or something like that. And it was rediscovered uh, many, many years later, like in maybe 80, 90s, by these three guys. And <laughs> look at the names and the, look at the initials. <laughs> no, 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 they're not that bad. They didn't do it. Other people made that up. <laughs> so, so they say that something that when you take a probe in and you see zero measure is called, the property is called shy. Okay, which is the same as saying you can recognize what is typical, what is not typical, right, basically. Okay. Now, but so what is new here is that, okay, so I made a connection to dynamical systems. It's perfectly natural that if you, um, you, you, you cannot take, you know, I mean, the, the, the fact that you, you have this object here is a perfectly natural thing, and the dimension of the probes matter. Okay. So there was all the, these definitions, of course, are very complicated. Anytime you want to say anything in infinite dimension, do I take every probe? Do I take all probes? Do I take linear probes? Do I take, you know, that one? okay. So in this situation, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that your thing has to have high enough dimension. It has to cut the, it has to cut the, the it has to be transversal to the stable foliation. Okay. So it, it's, a, it's a picture that actually kind of works. Okay. So now I want to, uh, go to something that's a little bit more general. And it actually doesn't have to be infinite dimension. Any kind of high dimensional dynamical systems, there's never going to be a theory of high dimensional dynamical systems because it comes in way too many different flavors. So, so to fix ideas, I want to kind of focus on things that are, for example, the kind of dynamical systems that are, that, that are satisfied by the, the semi-flows generated by, say, some class of PDEs like this where x is a function space, a is nonlinear, f linear. So now to def so so I'm now going general, right? No more no more uh, no, no more no no more uh, uh, center manifolds. Okay, so I'm going trying to duplicate the theory that I talked about at the beginning. So in order to a dynamical system on this function space or, or, or somewhere, of course you have to have a phase space, right? So that's your function space. So uh, w whatever is suitable, probably something that incorporates the boundary conditions into some Sobolev space, something like that. And in order to find this, so you have an initial condition and you have existence and uniqueness solution, so you have a semi-flow. All this is pretty normal and standard. And the uh, t going to u of t is going to be continuous, and I'm not going to differentiate in t, don't worry. Okay. Uh, the last one may be a problem. Okay. So this, this last point is something that's a little bit different and not what one normally talks about. Okay. So here by CR, I'm not thinking about the regularity of the solution. It's not the regularity of the solution that's in question. That is determined by the x, right? Whatever function space is in, you are in there already. Okay. Ft being CR, ah, this is a very, uh, this is very bad notation. This is exactly, yeah, 
Yeah, this is exactly what it should not be. <laughs> this is exactly not what it should not be. Okay. Oh no, this is true. This is the map, right? Okay, this is the map. Yes, I use it to more than one way. Yeah. I used F lots of ways. Okay. I'm referring here to this map. Okay. So what I mean is that you take an initial condition and you look at what what it is time t later. So that's a map that goes from x to x. Okay. I want that map to be CR. Okay. And CR with respect to the same function space. Whatever you choose it at the beginning, you got to stick with it. You can't switch to it. I'm, I'm going to estimate this in a different norm. See, this is the thing that unfortunately is what you need. Okay, so I mean, for if you want to, uh, of course you have to have a phase space and have a semi-flow defined before you can talk about dynamics, right? But if you, th that's talking about just talking about dynamics. But if you want to leverage the differentiable techniques and the geometric techniques if in finite dimension, then your mapping has got to be CR, and CR means this that you have to find the right uh, function space so that the mapping for that sends initial conditions to what they look like uh, t units of time later has to be smooth. How big does R have to be? Uh, generally, for most things, that one, one and, depending on what you do, more than one. Uh, one plus something, more, yeah, a little bit more than one is, is enough for most things in hyperbolic dynamics. Uh, depending on what you do, okay, if you are, if you are, see, there's a, there's a, in, a, in a lot of results about PDEs, they are about the construction of special solutions. When you talk about constructions of special solutions, you don't need any of this, right? If you construct a periodic orbit, you've got a periodic orbit, you've got a torus, you've got a torus. You don't have to talk about any of this. But if you want to do a Gothic theory for PDEs, you've got to have the space, <laughs> has to have the space in, so where you can put the measure, and that you have to, uh, if you want to do, use the geometric differentiable techniques, then you got to have that flow map has to be CR. And this is something that is a, can, be, can be a problem. So let me show that, I mean, mo most, most PDE results are kind of like a, uh, about specific. Here's one of the situations where the setup looks very much like the finite dimensional one. This is one of the few places that I know when it's so kind of completely abstract. Okay, so this is from Henry's book, 1980. If you take a Banach space and an operator, a, a sectorial operator, which is equivalent to the semigroup being analytic, I think of it as just Laplacian plus bounded, or it doesn't have to be bounded, but the, uh, the, the spectrum is contained in some wedge, and the resolvent has some control when you go to infinity. It doesn't have to be bounded. Laplacian plus something that's either bounded or some control when you go to infinity. Okay? Um, so uh, for, for this abstract class of operators, you, there's always a family of interpolation spaces. So I think of the right one, x0 is uh, L2, x1 is H2, something like that. But this is abstract. Okay. And with norms that are stronger and weaker like this. And here's a result that tells me that it's uh, so, so a lot of things are in that category. So, so, so this, gives a, this says that my, the assumptions are not empty. So if you have a differential equation with a sectorial operator, the A, the, the operator determines that function space. And which alpha is good is determined by the nonlinear part. Okay. So the linear part determines that uh, this set of spaces where you are going to interpolate between. And the nonlinear part, the F, determines the, uh, which alpha in the sense that if that one goes from x to alpha to x is CR, then the whole flow map is CR. Okay. So, so, okay. so you can, uh, these things are there. I'm not talking about an empty set. Okay. And of course, by solution, I really mean this. Okay. I mean a mild solution. OK, so um, I want to discuss uh, two kind of general results for uh, infinite dimensional dynamical systems. And so the technical assumptions are that I start with either a Banach or a Hilbert space. I want a semi-flow. Um, I, I, I want to have a semi-flow, which is, um, I said C2, C1 plus epsilon is uh, also as good. 
um, and of course I don't need that at zero. Okay. This one, I, I want the maps and the derivatives to be injective is what I use. I don't actually know if it's necessary, but uh, I, I have trouble without it. So it's in my proofs. So this is equivalent to backward uniqueness. Okay. And I need there to be a compact set that attracts. Okay. So it's definitely in the dissipative category when you have a set that absorbing set, things go into an attractor. And so if I, this last one is not an assumption. If you have an attracting of a compact set, of course it has lots and lots of uh, invariant measures. Okay. So this is the setting in which I think one could, uh, the, the, the most, uh, uh, is close enough to finite dimension that is going to, um, it, it, uh, one, one could push the finite dimensional theory over uh, relatively easily. So these are some of the finite dimensional dynamical systems ideas that have been generalized. The first is uh, Lyapunov exponents, uh, and I, I will say something about that. So uh, Lyapunov exponents, I think everybody knows what Lyapunov exponents are, right? Okay. And uh, stable and unstable manifolds, okay, which are the nonlinear objects that accompany the infinitesimal ideas. So, so this one I'm going to skip. And then there's the absolute continuity of this uh, stable foliation in general, not without the center manifold now. So let me say some, something about the difference between finite and infinite dimension for Lyapunov exponents. So I now have the time t map of a semi-flow, um, and I have an invariant measure. So the, the thing about Lyapunov exponents is that, so it's, it's, it's that in infinite dimension, there may be part of the spectrum that you cannot resolve. So how can you talk about Lyapunov exponents if there's a chunk of the spectrum? Let's think about just one map. If you, if you have one infinite dimensional map from an infinite dimensional Banach space to itself, if there's a chunk of the spectrum that you cannot resolve, then how can you talk about this Lyapunov exponents? What do you mean a chunk of the spectrum you can't resolve? Well, I mean, it, it, if, uh, when you have a Lyapunov exponents, it's a growth rate in some direction. So if you have like a pole or something like that, then you, it's an eigenvalue. Then you, then you can say, OK, if I, if I take an eigenvector in that direction, I iterate it, it's going to grow like that eigenvalue. Yeah. But if, I have a, uh, if the spectrum has a chunk in it, like if it's an essential spectrum, then you cannot tell what's going on inside. You cannot say anything about growth rates. Of, uh, you can, okay? that's, the, that, that's, that's the difference. And so to, so the, to do that, uh, so I have to do something about this, this things inside the essential spectral radius. And uh, probably it's, it's easier for uh, Gothic theory purposes to not think about so much the essential spectral radius, but think of it as it's, it's the same thing, a Kuratowski measure of non-compactness, okay? which means, which is the, the number that I have defined up there. So the Kuratowski measure of non-compactness of a, a linear operator is the following. I take a unit ball, I look at this image. I'm going to take tiny balls, I'm going to try to cover for the image of my ball with these tiny balls, okay? <coughs> if it's finite rank, take any tiny set of tiny balls, a finite number of them will cover. But if it's not a finite rank, when the balls are too tiny, then you won't be able to cover it with finitely many. The smallest r is this Kuratowski measure of non-compactness. And so it's this t that you're referring to, that would be It's a linear operator. That would be the derivative? There is a derivative. The derivative of it is a derivative, yeah. yes. So the reason for using this, instead of saying the spectral radius, which uh, spectral, uh, essential spectral radius, which is defined for a single map, is that this thing uh, composes. So you can, you can compose it from step to step. And because it's a, a sub-additive, you will get an asymptotic rate of Kuratowski measure of non-compactness. Okay? So that's why it works very well for ergodic theory. Okay? Um, probably you can say do the same thing for spectral radius. but. It's harder to prove, I think, than that, that the fact that this limit would exist and so on. Okay. But this limit exists, so there really is a number. It is equivalent to a spectral radius? It, for a single operator, yeah. 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 I, I don't know when, uh, when you compose the, the things. Okay. So uh, this is a theorem that's been proved, again, by many people under slightly different assumptions for, for a while. Okay. So I'm going to give you just the ergodic version. So it basically, 
anything that lies below that Kurotovsky measure of compactness, that, that's asymptotic value, I cannot say anything about. Okay? But if you take a number which is bigger than that, then everything else would be just like in finite dimension. That's kind of the theorem. Okay? So you, you would have, I'm just saying all of these things, but they are exactly what you would expect. This is exactly the finite dimensional version. Of course, there's a chunk. Okay? That this is the chunk. This f part is the chunk that corresponds to the part below this uh, Kurotovsky measure of non-compactness, so I cannot do anything about it. So this thing goes inside of itself, and all that I know is that it can't it it's, it can't grow faster than this number. The, this is all that I know. And if you are in a Banach space, then use projections instead of angles. But there are all kinds of. But anyway, all finite dimensional things go through once you for as long as you are above this Kurotovsky thing. Okay. Because uh, above this, there's only a finite number of them. Oh, they could coincide. I didn't say. Oh, did I say they are just? They're distinct, but they're, I didn't say each one is uh, does, could have a multiplicity. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. It's the same as in finite dimension. Oh. There's really no no. Yeah. Yes. There's no no distinction oh. whatsoever. It's just that that's as far as you can go. Yeah. And, uh, I yeah. Didn't yeah. 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 So, they now, this is kind of so far as those sort of abstract. But if you want to talk about expanding, neutral, contracting, so you can talk about stable and stable manifolds, those things, then you better have your Kurotovsky measure in a strictly negative one. Otherwise, it would cover everything. <laughs> you won't be able to say very much, right? If it's small enough so that you can distinct, so basically if it's small enough, then you have the, all the expanding ones and there's a finite number of them. Neutral ones, there's a finite number of them. And uh, contracting ones and a chunk that you just lump together in, inside some infinite dimensional thing. And this is how, wh what you would do, okay? And uh, when you have that, then um, you will, the, the, the results for stable and unstable manifolds would carry over. It's, it, it's more work to prove, but not conceptually, not so difficult. And the idea of SRB measure even carries over. The SRB measure just says that, oh, it's got positive exponents, so exponents are now well defined. And uh, it's uh, conditional measures and unstable manifolds, that's well defined. So the ideas make sense. So now the theorem, uh, which uh, is the last theorem that I'm going to show, says that if the setting is uh, as above and mu is an SRB measure and there are no zero to Epinoff exponents, then the stable foliation is absolutely continuous. Okay. This is a finite dimensional result, and that's true. Okay. Well, the work uh, to do it is a little bit more work because now, you know, um, you know in Banach spaces, you don't even have the notion of volume, right? So <laughs> when you pass things around, there are all kinds of technical things that you have to deal with. But at the end of the day, all is well. So it works. Okay? You don't actually need a notion of volume. You just need to know what's a big measure class, actually. right? So these things all work. So what does this mean? Uh, the interpretation is that, well, the same as in the center manifolds case. It means that this SRB measure mu is visible. Remember this, uh, this, this picture, uh, th this picture, a <laughs> whole lecture long, I'm drawing the same picture, that this is the unstable, and the measures here are Lebesgue, almost every point is typical, and now you have this foliation. If it's absolutely continuous, it goes right over. So now, it means that you have a kind of, it's visible. You take any k-dimensional, if this thing is k-dimensional, so you take any k-dimensional, uh, k-parameter family of, uh, uh, initial conditions, you know what it means for it to be typical, and it's visible because you, it's reflected by the measure mu. Okay? So the, the, the basically the same thing, the same finite dimensional picture works, even though you don't have Lebesgue in the whole thing anymore. You replace that by slices of k okay, dimension. Then you, you have to assume mu is SRB, right? I have to assume. That's exactly the thing. This is the whole trouble with this deterministic theory. You have to have an SRB before you have this. Like I, if I have a little bit of noise, then am I, am I okay? 
Ah, uh, you took away my punchline. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is actually the, yes, this is exactly the point, okay? F the finite theory <coughs> carries over. It, it, it's, it's nice when you have an SRB measure. Uh, everything kind of really fits in place, but it's just so hard to prove that there, there's something has an SRB measure, okay? Um, the idea is that if you go to, uh, it, so, so in finite dimension, I try to convince you that if I add a little bit of noise, then I'm all good. Okay? Well, why can't I add a little bit of noise in infinite dimension and, and probably and hope that I'm all good also? And that's kind of what I'm working on. Okay? So uh, I sh how do I add? Okay, I think if I force it in finitely many modes, okay? but enough modes to take care of all the unstable directions, then it will be as though I had something that's like what I have. See, I don't in finite dimension. I don't really need the whole thing to be to, to be Lebesgue. I just really need it to be smooth in something enough for the unstable. So if I force it in enough modes, it will probably produce the same hope for a picture without any assumption of SRB measures. And that's kind of my hope. That uh, uh, and but once you have that, uh, this one is for a deterministic case. I'm Sure, it's going to work for the, the, the random case for random maps. So now you have the picture. And you can use this finite dimension and uh, propagate it to the rest of the space. That's all that I have. Yeah. <laughs>